fairly close to the surface. So it's, it's all sort of weathered. It's quite sort of broken up and crumbly, generally. When you get further in by, it's much more solid. Which is why when they were trialling, digging a drift to examine the ironstone, they'd go in quite a distance. And there's a, there's a, a particularly good trial at um, near Gromont, at Merckside. And again, they've really gone in quite a distance to find good quality uh, ironstone away from this stuff that's been affected by the uh, you know, water leaching in and uh, the weather and such like. Now we have the start there of a new passageway. That would have been uh, driven forward as a, as, a, as a new working place for two or two miners. And it's parallel to a passageway off to our right. And between those two passageways, we would have left a solid pillar of ironstone. And that's how you get the development of this board and pillar method of working. The passageways are known as boards. And of course, the ironstone between them, those were the pillars of ironstone. And the intention was to work that in that way. So as much of the uh, available seam of ironstone was broken up. And then later on, um, to work back and split up the pillars with the intention of removing as much of the ironstone as possible and then allowing the roof to collapse. Right, this is the ironstone main seam and it consists of two blocks. You've got an upper block of ironstone and then down here you've got a lower block. And between the two, marked by this dark band, you've got a band of shale. Now, to work the ironstone, you've got to take out the full amount. But the shale is detrimental to the ironstone when it goes to the blast furnace, so that's got to be dumped. Now, we don't want that in the, the outside of the works. It's either got to stay underground here, or it's got to be tipped on the surface. It's certainly easier and cheaper to leave it underground. But it's this ironstone at the top and the ironstone at the bottom that's that's, that's the payload, that's what needs working out, and that's what uh, pays the money. Einstone, if freshly broken off, it'll have a sort of a bluey grey sheen to it, bluey grey colour. This, because it's been exposed here to this atmosphere for, what, a cent over a century, You've got this sort of carbonate that's covered the surface, so, so the colour is, is, is changed. What, what should be this bluey grey colour is now a white carbonate. And same at the bottom here. And the, the, wandering around these workings, that's some of the ways you can identify the ironstone by its this sort of white colouring. Above it is a very thin uh, sulphur band. Now certainly in the 1870s, the sulphur band could be mined separately and uh, sold as uh, for making sulfuric acid. But again, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, the, the trade went out of that, so it was just dumped. But again, because it's sulfur, it had to be kept out of the, the, uh, the ironstone going to the, uh, the blast furnaces. And over here, there's been an air door. Now the air door, the purpose of it was to direct air around the workings and uh, Certainly in some of the mines, there was a, the young lad, the first job when they went into the mine was to sit at one of these doors and open it and close it to allow uh, wagons of ironstone to, uh, to go through it. A pretty lonely, dark job. Now, there's not much left of the door, of course, because it's rotten, but uh, you can see here the, um, one of the uh, hinges for the door, and the, uh, there's the door handle left behind. This thing here is a dog spike. That was used for fixing the rails to the sleepers. This bit here is a, is a corner post from a tub and this is part of the strapping to keep the, the wooden body of the tubs together. And then they sat on uh, a pair of um, wooden beams 
to uh, to keep the uh, as the sort of under under carriage of the, the the tub and the wooden because the long wooden b uh, beams supporting the underside of the tub because they were butting against other tubs the the beams would tend to split so these are around the end of the wooden beams and so they form a buffer so it's to stop the as the tubs butted together it's to stop the wood uh, wooden ends splitting And there is a hook off the end of a tub underneath, so that you can have tubs fastened together with a chain. This structure here, this wall, stone wall, it's a stopping. You've got to guide the air current around the mine to make sure that it ventilates as much of the mine workings as possible. So some of these passageways are stopped, are blocked off with these stoppings, and this is as made, built by the miners well over a century ago. And at some point, to make it even more airtight, somebody's attempted to, to, to smear mud on it. And as you can see, there's all the, the hand marks of whoever smeared the mud on this, on this wall, possibly 120 odd years ago. the rail those are original this side has disappeared and of course we've uh, walked across it but uh, when we've measured it two feet six inch gauge but that's original from 1876 so we're trying to avoid walking on it yeah, it's, a, it's a leather token and it looks to be 21 or perhaps 27 but we always thought that um, tokens were just um, you know, metal discs. But there's, this is, there were several here in, in this mine we found been uh, in leather. And of course these were the tokens that were f put onto each loaded tub. So as the tub came to the surface and was weighed, the amount of ironstone per number was that how the men were paid. Is it a six or is it a nine? But it's another leather, leather token. Well, there's the there's a, a, a roof a, ba a top or a base of a of a powder barrel and there's this bevel edge that would fit tightly into that groove these went around the outside of the barrel keeping all the staves together and usually nailed in with um, with copper nails because so the barrels of course we use for bringing gunpowder into the mine
we've got here a hole that's been drilled using a dr jumper drill. Been, the jumper drill's been rammed in from this direction and it's triangular in section. Now, having drilled the hole, taken what, half an hour, three quarters perhaps, to drill that hole, the next job was to dry it out. And they used to have, bring in hair, it's called wipe hair, and that was put into the hole, rubbed in with, um, with a, a, a scraper or whatever, to dry the hole out. Because the gunpowder that was going to go in there was, um, was in loose powder, or small, small, small pellets but it was loose, so it was important to have the hole nice and dry. And then, having take, brought the, the flask with the gunpowder in, the cap was taken off. Each cap worth was about two ounces of gunpowder, and that was fed into the hole, and then it was pushed in. And then they would use a, a device called a stemmer, perhaps a wooden stemmer or even a brass one, to push the gunpowder into the far end of the hole, and then it had to be compressed. Now part of the skill was being able to d determine how much gunpowder uh, was needed because of course the, the miners had to pay for all their own gunpowder, the gunpowder that they used. So it had to be put in, stemmed into the hole and it had to be compacted at the far end. Now when sufficient was put in the next thing, the hole had to be stemmed. And the hole was stemmed by getting a long thing called a pricker. It was a long tapering copper rod and the pointed end was put into the hole and the pricker was pushed in and then it was positioned so that the hole, the, the end of the pricker passed into the gunpowder. The next job was to stem any sort of material back into the hole using the pricker as a runner, the stemmer which had a half round cut out of it, ran on the top and you would sort of stem the hole quite hard. You were stemming mud drillings, fillings, whatever, to create a stemming, a solid filling of that hole. And then when that was full to the end of the hole, the pricker had to be drawn out. So it was leaving the gunpowder at the end of the drill hole, a long tapering hole going down to it, and then a lot of stemming, very hard packed stemming, because when the shot went off, you didn't want it blowing the stemming out, you wanted to blow the ironstone down. So that stemming had to be put in very hard and compact. The next thing was to take a squib, a squib was like a, like a firecracker, a long thin straw. L later on the, the Peyton squibs were soaked in a sort of a sulphur solution. So they used to burn slowly, but there was a, a, a small amount of gunpowder at one end of the squib. You put the squib into the hole, into this long tapering hole left by the pricker with an end of the squib sticking out and then the end of the squib was lit. Now all being well that would give a few seconds as the squib burnt down before it exploded. So that was it, hopefully enough time to take cover to get out of the place because when the squib burnt down it would set off that slight small charge of gunpowder sending a flame down the hole to explode, to blast the gunpowder at the end and hopefully blast down a significant amount of ironstone. Right, this is a squib. It's a genuine squib. Don't know how old it is, but um, quite ancient. We're gonna, we're gonna um, light it and see what happens. Now, it's a squib. It would be put into the hole to set off a charge and apparently the first thing we do is to bite off or break off the red end. I think that's the approved method of doing it. Now that's the end that's inserted into the hole. I haven't got a candle to light the other end but I've got a, a flame so Having done all that and hopefully the, the smoke from the gunpowder explosion would clear very quickly, the next job was to 
to start drilling the next hole while your mate loaded all this ironstone up, all the heavy pieces, into the tub. And the more he could load into the tub and the quicker he could load it, the more money the guys were going to get paid at the end of the shift or the end of the day or the, in the good old days at the time of this time of the 1870s they were frequently paid uh, at the end of a fortnight and that basically is how you drilled and blasted a hole and that's what your livelihood depended on and all by the light of candles <laughs>